for all mothers and sisters. Rome, June 15, 1960. On the occasion of the coming into force of the organization of academies, Mother Christina insists in this letter on the necessity of having the same modus operandi in all centers, especially in two areas of greater significance to them. The religious and academic formation of students and the care which must be extended to laypersons who collaborate in our works. My intention had been to direct this letter only to those of you who work in the academies, but I have decided that, given that we constitute a body with common interests and mutual influence, it would be good to address this letter to everyone, with the hope that we will all help one another to carry out the beautiful mission that the Lord has confided to us. Several years have gone by since, following the orientations received from the Church, we have intensified our efforts to adapt the organization of our academies to the demands of modern society. At that time, we would first prescribe relatively isolated norms relative to particular aspects of the life of the academy, later putting them together in a very incomplete form, and finally, as a temporary measure, a more finished organization, but still of a provisional nature. We already know from experience, in the light of the end, that we propose of forming our students in a comprehensive manner, in both their human and Christian aspects, the relative merits of the different ways of proceeding. I think that it is now time to draw up the Academy Organization, which many of you have desired and often requested of me. The organization will come into force in our academies in Europe, North America and Cuba on October 1, 1960, in the other schools on January 1, 1961. I want you to read it now, become thoroughly acquainted with it, internalize it, so that not only do you know in every circumstance what has to be done, but you can at the same time provide a reason for what is done. Without doubt the fulfillment of some provisions will be difficult. In those cases, look willingly for the solution without exempting yourselves from compliance with what is prescribed because of a first impression. Complying with what is set forth in the organization, we will succeed in forming a solid tradition which will give efficacy and permanence to our educational work. I very much want you to adhere faithfully to what is set forth in Chapter I. If those who are assigned to this work of apostolate are familiar with it, and all of you together make the effort to put it into practice, our students will not graduate without having acquired a solid religious formation. I also want to remind you that assuming responsibility for diligently fulfilling one's duties is a very important aspect of moral formation, and as studying is their principal duty and perhaps the one that which demands the most effort and sacrifice, it is indispensable that you do as much as possible to encourage the students to study seriously and diligently. It will help if the teachers provide the girls with the assistance they need, so that even those with less ability for studies may achieve the highest level of which they are capable. The methods that you should employ in order to achieve this are, along with understanding and interest for each one of the pupils, diligent preparation, long-term and immediate, of your classes, and the utilization of modern teaching aids, according to what is set forth in Article 482 of the organization. I want to deal with another point which in our current situation is of special interest in regard to the end which we have proposed, the lay teachers and support personnel. Very frequently, and from different places, I have been informed of your feelings about not having a greater number of mother and sisters. It would be good for us all to pray to the Lord to help us discover the best ways to foster vocations and to make the effort to put them into practice, which is the only way to increase our religious personnel. On the other hand, it is not in your power, nor in mine, to provide a greater number of mothers or sisters to the academies except little by little and within certain limits, as we are doing. However, would it not be possible to obtain from our lay teachers and other school personnel a greater collaboration in education? I think that it would. The organization emphasizes that we regard them as collaborators in the apostolate. I recommend that the superiors, prefects and subprefects, and all the mothers and sisters of the academy think about what could be done in order to make sure that this provision does not become a dead letter. I think that the following means would be efficacious. First, give generous salaries to the teachers, 
they will help to calculate the salaries if you put yourselves in their place. I understand that for the academies, especially those that are experiencing somewhat difficult economic circumstances, the remuneration of the lay faculty involves a sacrifice. However, we also have to consider how these teachers will be able to support their families with the salaries that they are receiving. I think it is so necessary to pay the teachers generously that I do not hesitate to advise you to sacrifice other things, though also necessary or very advisable, such as the interior decoration of the academy, the construction of sports fields, and even part of the instructional materials. When you find a teacher that you are satisfied with, try to pay her well and treat her in a way that, considering the amount of the remuneration as well as the matter of job security, her situation is not inferior to what it would be in a state school. You will always need lay teachers, and what I am advising you will be the only way that the best ones will apply to you academy and will not leave on finding a more advantageous position. Secondly, it will help to provide them with opportunities to enrich their intellectual, educational and pedagogical formation. Encourage them to attend conferences, financing as advisable, necessary, and possible, their attendance at in-service courses which are offered for teachers according to the subjects taught, whether these be organized by state agencies or by our congregation. I know that this has been done in one province with excellent results. Now that we have in the academies mothers who have finished their studies in Regina Mundi or in Lux Vera, I suggest that they organize for the lay teachers some good classes of religion on appropriate days and times. Finally, in the simplicity with which you have recourse to them, and in the responsibilities that you entrust to them, show that in fact they are taking part in the mission of educating, through the spiritual exercises, retreats, meetings, and other means which the love of our Lord and for souls inspires you, try to enkindle in them or maintain the flame of their zeal, while at the same time teaching them how to put it into practice. I do not want to end without telling you how happy I am with the work that is being done. It is a great consolation for me, as it must also be for you, to witness the good spirit which, thanks be to God, reigns in the academies, and the fruit which is produced in them. At times we do not see this at the moments that we would wish, but we should not let this discourage us. Let us be convinced that we have not sowed the seed in vain, and that sooner or later it will germinate. Let us never forget that, in addition to the other means which we should not neglect, prayer and good example are especially efficacious. May our union with God and with one another illuminate the way for our students. Christina Estrada ACI to the mothers and sisters of all of our schools. Rome, October 11, 1962. Keeping our schools free of charge and their organization were two topics to which Mother Christina paid constant attention, as this letter shows. This letter also includes some valuable guidelines for achieving a good atmosphere in our centers. It is a consolation for me to see how much you are doing in the great work that our Lord, through obedience, has entrusted to you, and the interest with which you are doing it, not sparing yourselves any sacrifice. I know that, thanks be to God, it is bearing much fruit, not only in the girls, but also within the families. A short while ago I wrote to the parents about the statutes of the association, and I am going to tell you also something that, if all of you keep it in mind and practice it, will make your apostolic labors even more efficacious. 1. I do not want to spend too much time on the content of the statutes of the Parents' Association, although I advise all of you to become acquainted with them. In the letter that I wrote to the parents, and which I recommend that you read along with the statutes, you will find an explanation of them. However I do desire to call your attention to one point, which is that of the schools being free of charge. Our constitutions, in Numbers 88, 255, 271, 294 and 295 of Part 1, stipulate that the education in the schools be free of charge. 
Moreover, those who live here in Rome, in the very center of the church and near the vicar of Jesus Christ, know how much the church desires education and other apostolic works to remain free of charge, and how pleased it is when it sees this put into practice. You can add to these one more reason to keep education free of charge, as is prescribed in the constitutions in regard to the schools. As it is now being understood that culture should be the patrimony of all persons, and not the monopoly of the privileged class of society, governments are extending the years of obligatory schooling, and on making it obligatory, they also make it free of charge. With a broad view which looks toward the future, we have to make an effort to preserve in the church the glory that has belonged to it though the centuries, that of having been the educator of the people and the transmitter of culture. This we will do if we serve the children of the working class, even those of the humblest families, which today are hungry for culture. However the poorest cannot pay for their education, and still others, who may be better off, cannot do so without sacrifice if they have a large family. To overcome this difficulty, Article 24 of the Statutes mentions voluntary fees. I do not want the people to be obligated to contribute financially. Their being completely free of charge will permit our schools to enroll many children who otherwise would go to government schools and, in certain countries, to Protestant schools or communist infiltrated schools. Some of you will mention again the difficulty that has been suggested to you, that the families esteem our education less because it is free of charge. The best way for me to demonstrate the inconsistency of this objection is with the facts. The majority of our schools are completely full, and it is with regret that we have to deny admission to many children because of lack of space. The gratitude of the parents for our work with their daughters is great, as I read in the reports that I receive from all over the congregation. I tell you all this so that you may have the right criteria, and that you may know how to respond to those who think differently. Moreover, in this sense you have to encourage the parents, since some, who are financially better off, might want us to proceed in a different way, without realizing that not everyone is in the same situation as they are. Number 294, which I have already mentioned, prohibits us from receiving any donations from the children or their families, and this I want to be observed exactly in regard to the school and to ourselves. However, we can permit the association of parents to help the extracurricular and after-school activities which, though related to the school, are not considered the school itself. Two, however, being free of charge will not produce all the desired effects if you do not give preference of admission to the children who belong to the poorest and neediest families which is also set forth in number 255, part 1 of the Constitutions. I think that in this matter there has been some error, although with the best of intentions, interpreting it to mean that we should give preference to the children with the most aptitude for studies. We must seek the greater good of the children in general, which coincides with the greater glory of God, the ultimate end which we propose. The good of the children demands that we do not admit to the school those whose intellectual level is so low that it would be to the detriment of their classmates, and apart from the primary courses, also the level of instruction has to be such that some children do not put the others at a disadvantage. In order to admit even those children whose level of instruction is below what corresponds to their age, an ungraded level was designed, and I am hoping that you will have this in place all the schools. However, aside from that, for admission into the kindergarten, which is where each year the greatest number of new children are enrolled, you do not have to keep in mind the level of instruction. As regards the intelligence quotient, I desire to give the guideline that you do not take this into account as a factor for admission except in the instance of a child with subnormal intelligence, for these should not be admitted. From now on you can go by this guideline. The reason that I am giving it is that children of four, five and even six or seven years of age who live in a culturally deprived environment have a poor vocabulary, frequently have not developed other abilities, and have IQ scores inferior to what corresponds to their aptitude. 3. Everything that I have said refers to the external organization of the school. However, as His Holiness Pius XI tells us in his encyclical Divini Ilius Magistri, good schools are the fruit not so much of good organization, but principally of good teachers. 
For this reason, I want to encourage each of you, mothers and sisters, to make the effort to be excellent teachers. I do not exclude the intellectual or instructional aspects in which it is indispensable for you to work very well, but for now I am not going to focus on this. I am referring to the educational aspect. You have to endeavor to be outstanding in the art of forming the students to be good Christians. This will be fostered not only by what each one of you teaches or says to each child or to all the children, but even more by the atmosphere that you have managed to create in the school. It is not each mother or sister or even the M prefect individually who educates, it is the entire school, its atmosphere which is comprised of the criteria, the ideals, the desires, the effort, the actions, the entire life of the school. We create the atmosphere by what we say, and still more by what we do, with our individual actions, with the way we deal with one another and with the children. I would like each one of you to examine herself a bit and see what influence she has on the atmosphere of the school. Do you contribute to its being simple, joyful, friendly, supernatural, and fervent? If you are contributing to it, give thanks to God and encourage yourself to influence it even more favorably in the future. If you humbly recognize that you have added a negative note, you should resolve to amend, cooperating enthusiastically from now on. If you have isolated yourself somewhat, do not feel satisfied with this. You must persuade yourself that we all have an influence, and she who separates herself adds a note of aloofness, which is very detrimental. As I know that you all have good will, I will remind you that there are three factors that can influence the attainment of a high level. A supernatural spirit. The children should be aware of it when they see how you work, how you overcome difficulties or obstacles, etc. And that your motives are supernatural, so that they may realize that to overcome an obstacle you have recourse to prayer. That through your example, you encourage them to have a great heart, full of love for the Lord, and through him, of zeal for souls and love also for the church, the mystical body of Christ, and that through this the girls may learn to forget themselves and the thousand petty things that are the fruit of selfishness. Following from this supernatural spirit is the second factor for a good atmosphere. Be that you seek always the good of the children in all aspects, the effective use of their studies, reasonable well-being and healthy joy in life, their legitimate satisfactions and above all their spiritual good. Do not shrink from any sacrifice which will help attain the goal that the children become solidly Christian and fervent. If you seek this because of love of the Lord, there will be no danger of favoritism, so that if any children happen to receive preference, it will be those who are the poorest and most unfortunate. See the third factor has to be union and friendly sisterly collaboration among all those who are working in the school. We all have, in addition to the good qualities that the Lord has granted us, defects which can be attributed to our limitations. I would wish that you persuade yourselves that these do not proceed from ill will, and that frequently they give the very sisters who have them, the opportunity to practice many acts of virtue. If in your heart you cherish these sentiments for one another and are ready to overcome everything for the good of the children, I hope that the schools will achieve an ideal atmosphere which will greatly contribute to the good formation of the students. This atmosphere will generate many religious vocations so necessary today in order to serve the great needs of the church. You and I know that what I have told you cannot be achieved without great self-abnegation. Now that we are in the atmosphere of the ecumenical council, desirous of achieving through our prayer and sacrifice a very abundant outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon it. There is no better way to employ these desires and in sacrificing whatever would be an obstacle to this union which will so help the children that the Lord has placed in your hands. Christina Estrada ICI Sister Rosario El Leo, 1987-1997 First Latin American Asia Educational Conference Cushabamba, August 1995 
In April 1994, Sister Rosario Leo convoked a meeting about education in our Latin American centers. This conference was held in Cochabamba in August 1995. The conference had as its objective to respond to the challenges springing from the concrete contexts of each country, first, to the call to the new evangelization. Responding from our reparative mission and identity as handmaids of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and secondly, to a renewed commitment to our education in service of the Gospel, according to what is asked of us in General Congregation 15. In this context we find the following talk given by Sister Rosario. In it, besides emphasizing the importance of our education and analyzing some of the problems it was undergoing in those times in Latin America, she develops in depth what it means to form our students from the perspective of the spirituality, the Sacred Heart, educating them to live with love and for love. Introduction This year 1995 is a special one worldwide. Several events are taking place. 50th Anniversary of the Organization of the United Nations 50th Anniversary of the End of the Second World War 50th Anniversary of the Nuclear Era, which began with the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This year in Copenhagen from the 6th to the 12th of March the World Summit for Social Development took place, with a call to change the structures that deprive the poor of well-being. In Beijing, China from the 4th to the 15th of September the 4th UN World Conference on Women will be held, with the theme, Development, Equality, Peace. There also, from the 30th of August to the 8th of September, the Forum of the NGO will be held, with the theme, Look at the World Through Women's Eyes. 30,000 participants are expected. Along with all of these significant world events taking place this year, we educators of the educational centers of the Handmaids of the Sacred Heart of Jesus have also come together for a very important event. The first meeting on ASEA education in Latin America. Anticipated and requested for many years, at last it has become a reality thanks to the perseverance and the work of the Coordinating Commission, led by Sister Emma Rioja and guided by Father Jesus Montero, S.J., at this time in which the Church counts very much on the laity for its work of evangelization, it is a joy for us to be here with so many lay collaborators who share our concern for education that is not only Christian and comprehensive, but also according to our charism. 1. The importance of education We all know that in the last few years education has been in the news. Many states have undertaken reforms of the educational system. FR. Montero knows a great deal about this, since he has a prominent role in the reforms that are being carried out in Paraguay. There have been meetings and congresses about education. One significant note is that at the last meeting of Ministers of Education in Europe last year, for the first time there were representatives from all countries, with the exception of Serbia for obvious reasons. This indicates the interest which the governments have in education at this time. The president of UNESCO, Federico Mayer, in November of 1993, said that there is a growing need for education. There are still 800 million illiterate persons in the world, and 130 million of these are unschooled children, of whom two-thirds are girls. He added that in the face of the challenges and the promises anticipated in the third millennium, there is no salvation except education. In Latin America, which is what concerns us most, the Fourth Salam Conference in Santo Domingo, following Medellin and Puebla, pointed out important aspects for Catholic education in our time. Moreover, the CLAR, in its Comprehensive Plan 1994 to 1997, devotes the second project to religious educators because 50% of the religious of Latin America work in the field of education. We can say that education is becoming increasingly valued. Mark Twain said with a sense of humor, soap and education are not as sudden as a massacre, but they are more deadly in the long run. Today many would agree, the world is not changed through violence, but through education. Therefore some refuse to change the world, they find this art too difficult. Others who are more ambitious, parents, educators, pastors, dedicate themselves to it with the patience of a sore and the boldness of adventures. In fact, education is an adventure. Instruction develops knowledge and practical learning. However, who is teaching how to find meaning in life? The exaggerated importance of having and of knowing often obscures the reasons for living. 
This incertitude of the modern conscience, at the crossroads of so many pathways and of so many failures, is the reason for the justified fear that the demise of laissez faire may be followed by the rigidity of a new moral order, and this gives rise today to a renewed interest in education, an interest stimulated by the very modern attention to the comprehensive development of the human person, a development that Paul VI affirmed was the first of our duties. Education is also an art, as we were saying, a difficult and necessary art. Difficult because education implements a project for others. Necessary because the child, as differentiated from the animal, comes into the world as an unfinished being who cannot grow toward what he must become unless he knows that he is called and wanted. We Catholic educators cannot forget that, above all, the child is called by God. Yahweh chose me before I was born, from my mother's womb he called my name. In our context of mass education, this attention to the person bears witness, in the beautiful expression of Vatican Roman II, that it is the only creature that God has loved for its own sake. Since God manifested himself in our history through the act of drawing out, educe, educate his people from slavery in order to make a covenant with free men, the act of education participates in a mystery that transcends the very person of the educator and that commits him to a greater degree and what would appear at first glance. Therefore, we have been able to demonstrate the importance of education in all eras and especially at this time in history. However, I believe that among ourselves, educators coming from all parts of Latin America, and our sisters from other countries who are here in order to learn from your experience, we do not need to dwell further upon the importance of education. Although it is good to remind ourselves for what and toward what goal we are educating. As the Santo Domingo document states, there is a human project within the whole educational project, and this project is either valid or not according to whether it builds up or destroys the person being educated. This is the educational value. When we speak of a Christian education we mean that the teacher educates toward a human project of man in which Jesus Christ is included N. 265. We cannot lose sight of this. 2. Education in Service of the Gospel In this educational work of ours, as religious and as laity, we want our frame of reference to be our spirit and our charism, from which springs education in service of the gospel. For us, the characteristic apostolate of the Institute is education in service of the gospel, which means evangelization understood as education of persons in the fullness of truth, Christ, this is also what the Santo Domingo document proposes in its pastoral guidelines. We commit ourselves to education in service of the gospel, the same expression in our constitutions, and in N263 we see Christian education indispensable in the new evangelization. This education in the service of the gospel which now concerns us is that which we are carrying out in Latin America. Therefore, for this apostolate, we have to begin from the reality in which we find ourselves. Briefly, we can point out some characteristics of this reality found in the countries represented here. The neoliberal ideology which permeates all areas of existence and of human activity, leading to individualism, to the loss of the sense of the common good, to the growing gap between rich and poor, to corruption, to lack of respect for life, to injustice, etc. The crisis of identity and values, which threatens and violates human rights and the dignity of persons, especially affecting women, children, and farm workers, who live in a situation of social deprivation and exploitation. The need to innovate the educational systems. Traditional impersonal schools predominate there is more importance given to the transmission of content. They overlook who it is that they are educating, how they educate, and the purpose for which they educate. Education does not prepare the person for life. There is little public investment in education, which results in low salaries for teachers, which obliges them to take on other activities which impede their exclusive dedication to education.
the millions of street children who are without schooling and whose lives are in constant danger. Illiteracy, above all, of women in rural and poor environments. There are also signs of life and hope for the prosperity and possibilities of our people. They have a sense of community, a capacity for solidarity, creativity to look for alternatives, capacity for resistance, faith in the God of life, a sense of celebration. In today's Latin American reality, we want to educate according to our charism. In order to do this we have come together. During these days, we will hear about reparative pedagogy in our task of education. I am going to focus on what the spirituality of the Sacred Heart presupposes, for that is our spirituality, in order to live in love and for love, and therefore how to educate for this purpose. 3. Educating Effectivity Until now systematic education has been considered as instruction in knowledge, in technology, and it has neglected the most important aspect of the person, which is the capacity for loving. If we desire a comprehensive formation for the student, we also have to educate the effectivity and teach her to love. Because man or woman cannot live without love, as Pope John Paul II stated in his encyclical Redemptor Hamides, he goes on to say, He remains a being that is incomprehensible for himself, his life is senseless, if love is not revealed to him, if he does not encounter love, if he does not experience it and make it his own, if he does not participate intimately in it. When an analysis is made of a society, when we contemplate the world in its current reality, there is an obvious lack of love among people, and this impoverishes them as persons. Our life has become complex in all aspects, with an often frenetic pace. Our emotions are bombarded by the mass media, with the risk of suffocation. Nevertheless, we cannot live without love. We are called to be messengers, signs of the love of God for all people, and in a special way for our students. We are also called to teach them to love. We, who treasure our Ignatian spirituality, know the importance that St. Ignatius gave to the effect. The book of the spiritual exercises is full of calls to the affection, the effect. In the first annotation it tells us that one must remove from oneself all disordered affections. Then it will speak of those who want to be more devoted in the service of their King and Lord, to become attached to the true doctrine of Christ our Lord. To ask for the grace to rejoice and be glad intensely at so great glory and joy of Christ our Lord. Pondering with much feeling how much our Lord has done for me, as one who makes an offering with much feeling. Father Kalvenbach, speaking of the Ignatian pedagogy tells us, in his contemplation of the presence of God in creation, Ignatius invites us to find, beyond logical analysis, an effective response to God. The imagination, the sentiments, the affections have a central role in the Ignatian pedagogy. The first handmaids, well grounded in Ignatian spirituality, also recognize the importance of affectivity in education. The first writings about education speak of effects. In the extract of an autobiography of Mother Martyrs, at that time Secretary of St. Raphaela in the year 1885, we see that education had a clear purpose, to make the Sacred Heart known so that he would be loved, served and imitated, instructing minds and rectifying the affections. This sounds very much like an echo of the Ignatian, get rid of disordered affections. The teachers had to consider that our Lord Jesus Christ has the students very much in his heart and that theirs have to be filled with the burning love that he has for all people. The love that they, the teachers have for them has to be tender, pure, altruistic. Moreover, as Jesus is the father of the poor, there has to be a special predilection for the neediest children. Education is a maternal task as well as a priesthood. The school is more than a supplement to the home. 
It is a sanctuary. It will serve for nothing to have taught many things if you do not know how to win their hearts. 4. The Spirituality of the Sacred Heart and Effectivity The spirituality of the Sacred Heart, well lived, is for us a resource for developing our personality. Learn from me. In his presence, we all feel accepted, unconditionally loved. In the person of Christ, God has inserted himself into our human situation with a truly human heart, as Rahner insists in his book Devotion to the Sacred Heart. Because of this, he understands us from within. He touches the effective roots of religiosity, and in particular the maternal aspect, represented by basic trust. The Sacred Heart is a welcoming, powerful, almost maternal presence, which fosters the strengths of the person. All of us present here know that this love of the heart of Jesus Christ has its greatest expression in the Eucharist. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Therefore the Eucharist, celebrated, adored and lived, will be for us the great stimulus for love in the educational task. Because our task is to form the effectivity, to teach them to love, by which we mean the path of maturation in order to love. This expression refers to a more or less slow and difficult process, to an experience acquired with patience, to a sustained effort to come face to face with reality, to broaden points of view, etc. This process requires time, perseverance, often demanding effort, sometimes difficult confrontation. It is not enough to dream, one must act and commit oneself. The centrality of the person and her rhythm is a key discovery in the educational world of the 20th century. Each child is different, and the learning activities are in service of the person and not vice versa. Also important is the research into the needs of the individual and the gradual process of the construction of one's identity. It is during education in childhood and adolescence that, in the best of cases, we can put into place the basic structures which will allow the person to attain a maturation of love. The uniqueness of the human person leads us not to compartmentalize, but to promote a harmonious development. We must not lose sight of this. We have to be persons who are effectively and vitally integrated. The unfocused heart cannot love truly P. Kalvenbach. The first thing that we have to do is to familiarize ourselves with effectivity. We have to face it without shielding ourselves from the mystery that it represents. If we do not do it this way, it will shake us up at the most inopportune moments. We all feel infinite desires for love, and we have to know what to do with those desires. We are effectivity become desires, just as we are body the base of effectivity. Those desires can mature in the direction pointed out by the gospel. We have been called to freedom in order to be masters of our lives, or we can succumb to its pressures crushing our being and definitively atrophying the life we have received. Affectivity is the vital energy which cuts across everything human and puts us in a position to feel, to say, to do, pushing us beyond ourselves and obliging us to establish bonds with others and with the world. Affectivity is oriented toward love. We have to make of it the organizing nucleus of all existence, it touches all levels of the person, physiological, unconscious, conscious, judgment, interpersonal relationships. It deals with the central aspect of the psychic life. Effective maturity is consolidation in love without strings attached, free from self-interest. It is the fruit of a progressive journey consisting of the following steps. 
recognizing the gift, the source of all good in God and in His Word, with the certainty of having been graced by His love. Being thankful for love in life, with the capacity for looking at the positive all is grace, with the capacity to go through daily life with a compassionate gaze. Loving and serving in everything, contemplating the world as inhabited by God, with soul, full of signs of the transparency of God. This is what Saint Raphaela Mary felt and lived. I am in this world as in a great temple, and I, as its priest, must offer continual sacrifice and continual praise, and always and all for the greater glory of God. Seeking active love, because God works in all of creation and in me also. Affectivity is educated by and requires responsibility in living. I must take my life into my hands and choose what I am going to pledge my life for. 5. Educating with love and for love. Love is the great secret and the soul of education, because if educating in a Christian manner is to bring the boy and girl to a comprehensive project in which Jesus Christ is included, the growth that this presupposes cannot be achieved without love. 5.1 Our Love for Students Love is the primary need in children's lives. Their qualities, in general, make them friendly, unpretentious, frank, innocent, tender. Moreover, Jesus told us that their angels constantly gaze upon the face of his Father, who is in heaven. Jesus loved children tenderly. He did not want the apostles to keep them away from him. In all his teaching love is always present to such a degree that he made it the sign I wish people would recognize that we are his disciples. Love is the characteristic of great educators. However, one must manage it well. One cannot confuse it with sentimentalism, with natural affinity, with weakness and condescendence, with more or less immediate self-interests. Love is impartial. We have to love all and each one of the students. We have to have solicitude and tenderness for all, not allowing ourselves to be swayed by preferences that are always exclusive. It goes even further, to favor the most needy and unfortunate, those less favored by nature or fortune, those with defects, with low intelligence, the orphans, the excluded. Love is vigilant. It is not authoritarian. It has a benign and compassionate gaze. Love is gentle, strong and reasonable. Do not to be severe and demanding, because all of us have defects, but on the contrary, be patient and gentle, correct appropriately. In these cases feel what was said so marvelously by Gabriella Mistral in her prayer of the teacher. Reprimand with sorrow in order to know that I have lovingly corrected. Encourage and praise effort and goodwill. Avoid instability and condescension, which makes us lose authority. Assign work and study, but do it in an agreeable manner. Encourage healthy enjoyment. Love is generous, it demands abnegation and sacrifice, it is altruistic. When one loves, says Saint Augustine, one does not feel tired, or one loves the very tiredness. Without love, education is martyrdom, a thankless chore. Five point two point three. Teaching them to love themselves. Nor is this an easy task, because there are students who have lived in family and social environments which did not foster self-esteem. We know today the importance of a healthy self-esteem in order to grow normally and to develop all our potential. For this reason it is very important to convince them, from when they are small children, that God loves them, Feeling oneself loved by God is perhaps the most authentic source of self-esteem. God loves me as the apple of his eye, Saint Raphaela once said. The Bible also assures us frequently, I have called you by your name, you are mine. Because you are precious in my sight, I hold you in esteem and I love you. 
Can a mother forget her baby, or stop loving the child of her womb? Then although she might forget, I will never forget you. Look how I have you carved on the palm of my hands. This love of God for them has to be made visible in the love that we have for them. We have to be signs of love, of tenderness, of the mercy of the heart of Christ. This is the best way for our students to experience the love that God has for them. It is the best way to be educators according to his heart. 6. Conclusion I believe that all of us are convinced of the importance of education, and for us, of educating according to the heart of God. During these days, we will become more enthusiastic about our work of education in service of the gospel. We hold in our hands the third millennium. A writer has said recently that the 21st century is being formed in the schools. This is a great responsibility for us. The document of Santo Domingo also urges us forward in this task, reminding us of the preferential option for the poor. We call on the religious who have abandoned this important field of Catholic education so that they may reincorporate themselves in this task. Remembering that the preferential option for the poor includes a preferential option for the means for the people to break out of their poverty, and one of the privileged means for this is Catholic education. A Latin American Jesuit has said that to abandon the ministry of education is equivalent to abandoning evangelization in the world. I believe that we are all convinced, and we need not insist upon this point. However, I hope that we will leave our meeting strengthened and enthusiastic about continuing on with this apostolate of education in the service of the gospel, that it may reach many children who are still unschooled, and that each one of our Catholic schools may be converted into a community which is a center of evangelization.